Africans. Then we go to look at these things that people say, well, why did it all disappear? How come it all this? But look at the present world today. Suppose there was a third world war, which God forbid, but suppose there was. Most of the technology of the world is concentrated at certain centers within a matter of minutes. And believe me, it is a matter of minutes. It's not no days and weeks. The preliminary battles may take a few days and weeks, movement of armies and a lot of bluffing. But when the bomb strikes, it's just a matter of minutes. And the people who, the people who don't see the light when it strikes are the lucky people. Most of the major cities of this civilization will be not even smoking. It will be almost nothing. The bombs dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki are baby bombs. They have bombs now 1,000 times more powerful. It does not smash cities. It turns them into vapor. Even the clouds burn. Even the waters of the ocean are thrown up into the sky. You can imagine what the hollow people might survive. People might survive, but they will survive on the periphery, the edge of the world. That is the people we're going to look to centuries down the road and say, that was their level, that was the level of science in the 20th century. And that's what they're doing to Africa. Because what they struck us with was equivalent to 100 hydrogen bombs. Particularly where they struck us most the consciousness of the African people. I have seen people breaths scraped in such a way that you wonder if there's a brain left at all. Everything is an echo and echo and echo. They haven't even begun to question the basics in this civilization. As Dr. Diop has shown that a great deal of the Greek science, and we're not attacking the Greeks, because they had their own genius too, but the basis, all these things they claim, you see, Hippocrates taking sections, sections out of the work of earlier Egyptian writers without giving any credit to them at all. Pythagoras, the Pythagorean theorem was worked out long ago. Pythagoras spent seven years, some people say 22 in Egypt, and he comes back with all this, even medical theories and brings it all back to Greece and all the claim. All the great European scholars went to Africa. Thales of Miletus, Democritus, Pythagoras, Eudocia. There's a whole list, a whole list of them walking into Africa, picking up things from astronomy, geometry, medicine, etc., and going back home and claiming it to be theirs. Father of this and father of that, when they're the children. <laughs> In the field of scripts, and this is one of the things, we are the non-literate peoples, we are the, I've often heard this, we are the simple peoples, the simple societies, we are the oral peoples. The English are oral, where is their script? This is not English script, this is Roman script. There were only a few Europeans who wrote, only a few Europeans had script and they gave it to the others. When Cicero conquered Britain, or when the Romans conquered Britain, I remembered Cicero saying, the English are so stupid, I am not even sure I could make them into good slaves. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not casting aspersion on the English, I'm just telling you what Cicero said. <laughs> but all this thing about oral, there are many scripts in Africa. The first script, the first major script that was to affect and influence a great part of the world was African. That script of Tarseti, which goes up and becomes more advanced and developed in Egypt as the Africans move up. The Meroitic script, which we have not yet broken. We have 800 texts in Meroitic. We haven't yet broken it, broken the code. We have Manding script. We have a whole series. I was in the jungles of Suriname and found them using the, the men were writing in the Afaka script to their girlfriends. They came with it from Africa, the Faka script, they were writing the Faka script, the Akan script. They developed apart from, they had, they had drum scripts. Nyangoran Boa has shown us the complicated drum scripts they developed. So that there are written scripts in Africa, so yes, only a few people use them. That was true of Europe too. 
Very few Europeans were literate. Even many medieval European kings did not write. They had this scholar caste as you had in African, American, in Asia. A few people wrote, it is only within recent times that you have the great mass of people educated. But it always seems because we stand at the end, broken and defeated, that we were the last to come on the ladder. No, sir. It's just the opposite. When you go and look at their medicine, I spoke to, in Atlanta to the Center for Disease Control. Africans had aspirin before us. They were using salix capensis, which is salicylic acid, the main active ingredient in aspirin. They were using tetracycline 14 centuries ago in Nubia. They found the yellow-green flash of tetracycline in Nubian bones 14 centuries ago. They only started using that antibiotic in America in the 1950s. They pioneered in several operations. They pioneered in the caesarean operation. Dr. Finch has written a fine thing on the caesarean. At the time when it, that operation was experimental in Europe, people like Dr. Felkin went into Africa and observed the Banyoro surgeons performing the caesarean, and the mother was hale and hearty after four or five days. No woman survived the caesarean in Europe in the 1870s. None. No woman survived. And they observed the operation, the way they stitched, the way they opened the belly, the way, the way, the kind of instruments they used, they observed they were using one of the instruments, the cautery iron, which such fantastic skill. It was very minor tissue damage, which it caused great ruptures in the European hospitals. They found that Africans were using both anesthetics and antiseptics in their operating theaters at that time, when in Europe, Listed only introduced antiseptics two years earlier than the witness of this operation, which the witness said was to be going on for quite a while because the Africans were performing with routine skill what was then experimental surgery in Europe. In the 13th century, they were performing eye cataract surgery in Jenne. But when we learn about African medicine, they go to the quacks because it's exotic and primitive and nice. So you go and you picture the quack. That's why the camera lies. You take the camera out, the camera is not supposed to lie, you concentrate on the edge of a world. You pick out the quack and you, you listen to everything. He says all his little magic and his nonsense. He says, well, that's African medicine. You don't deal with the scientific superstructure of that medicine. If I wanted to do that to American medicine, boy, are there quacks out there. I am terrified of getting sick because I'm sure my sickness would be fatal. I have never been diagnosed correctly. As soon as I get, I go to the diagnosis so that I could guess the worst possible scenario so I could fight against it. <laughs> so when you look at medical science, you see, for example, one of the innovations that Africans were the first to use drugs to deal with hypertension and certain forms of psychotic disorder. Even one of their medicines, Reserpine, comes out of the African medicine chest. They have a fast herb herbal pharmacology. We are only now beginning to study this and see the scientific knowledge the Africans had of plants. And when we talk about plants, they were the first in the agricultural field. Recently, there's been a big discovery which has been disputed where they found that Wadi Kubania and Wadi Tushka in Egypt and Nubia, the earliest cultivation of cereal, wheat, and barley, etc., and this was dated about 18,000 years ago, about 7,000 years before any other civilization. It has now been downdated. They said they made a mistake. But when they thought they were right, and that they had made a mistake, they start to excuse it. They said, it is probably not true that agriculture is the basis of civilization. 